This podcast is supported by Siemens, your partner for industrial grade AI. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of our Industrial AI Podcast. My name is Robert Beaver, and my guest today is Utz Uwehaus from HPE. Hello, Utz. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. How are you? Why don't you briefly introduce yourself briefly to the audience, Utz? All right. So my name is Utz Uwehaus. I run the HPE, HPC, and AI, so High Performance Computing and Artificial Intelligence MAR Research Lab inside uh, Hewlett Packard Labs one of the oldest research institutions in the IT industry. Maybe that's a good start. We want to talk a little bit about, sure, AI, industrial AI and hardware. And from my point of view, hardware is celebrating in revival in these days. What is your opinion? Clearly, hardware is celebrating a revival, let's say, especially as it's noticed in the industrial context. In the supercomputing HPC side, we always focused on hardware and also on the consumer side, people have been focusing on hardware a lot. But in the enterprise side, people have largely ignored hardware for many years, looking at software, software solutions, decks for industries, and suddenly specific hardware is coming back. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, but I think because we told them to invest in the cloud infrastructure and now they should invest in GPUs, CPUs, supercomputing on the shop floor. What should a company invest in? I don't think there is that much of a difference here. So cloud is not going away and on-site hardware, on-premise hardware is not going away. There has been a trend. So we have to invest both. In both at the right level for the right purpose. Okay. Can you explain it a little bit? If you look at the, the promise of cloud, it's the scalability, it's the experimental nature, and it's the deployment worldwide that is easy through hyperscaler investments or private cloud in the regions that enterprise is targeting. There is well-curated software stacks that make a similar deployment to one that you have in a different place, just a snap of a finger. So that's the promise of cloud, and that's not going away. There's good use cases for that, both in AI, but also in all the other compute that still is required from ERP systems to just import tax treatment, you know, all the things that you don't want on your own premises because it's too difficult to keep up. It's better left to specialized software stack vendors that sell you their solution as a service. But at the same time, even inside those clouds, suddenly there's a better awareness or needs to be a better awareness of which particular hardware you're running on. That starts from what is the cheapest solution, right? How can I get my flops per second at a low price. And that's where we see ARM coming in the data center suddenly, not just on the mobile phone. Oh, wow. um, and yeah. we're, we're seeing, on the other end, specialized accelerators or secure enclaves. That's a cloud topic that wasn't there like five years ago. But in terms of sovereignty about your data, understanding what compute is done where, how can you prove it's not been moved around in the background, that's a center topic suddenly in the cloud data centers. And it is a hardware-specific topic because you might not trust this technology versus that one. And that's where GPUs, or not so general purpose, accelerators come in for particular purposes. And we see the hyperscalers investing in specific hardware. And we see, on the other hand, the option to pull some of that back on premise if you realize that a certain compute need for a particular purpose needs to be close to your data and needs to be self-sovereign. And so on-premise, also because in the end, cloud is not cheap, right? It's an outsourcing of some sort, and outsourcing always needs to have a very clear cost-to-result computation. Can you go a little bit more, because you mentioned ARM, into details about ARM? Well, so if you look at the old ARM promise, it's energy efficiency and a reasonably open architecture. I mean, open here has many different interpretations, and let's not... It's a hot topic the in the moment, right? Yeah, it's a hot topic. Well, if you, if you talk about the European view on that, you might find some people saying ARM is not open enough. They want risk five discussions, but maybe that's not the scope for this podcast or for a different one. But ARM is open in the sense that there's a standard around the architecture. Different entities can license that IP. They can add their own. And in the end, a code written for whatever, a small Raspberry Pi 64-bit, if you get the bigger ones for like $20 instead of 10 the same code will, in some form, run on any other ARM, mm -hmm. I mean, give or take, up to 
the AI supercomputer that HP is currently delivering in Great Britain for the national infrastructure, which is a hundred million British pound Grace wow. NVIDIA CPU with GPUs, Hopper style GPUs attached to it, a proper supercomputing infrastructure, but for AI. Mm -hmm. And so that is a portability promise and it's a cost of ownership CPU promise that I'm not fully up to date, but I'm sure I saw Microsoft offering ARM in the cloud. Yes. There's uh, the NVIDIA chips that are available. There's other players really saying, if you're happy with that, I mean, even in Germany, the Hetzner infrastructure offers you a cloud VPS on ARM if you want these days. So there's a cost of ownership issue that gets us out of the x86 land that we've been in. And so flexibility is a topic. Some codes may run easily, especially the open source environment. Yes. Some vendor codes, ISV codes may need a bit of porting effort, but that keeps the IT industry alive, right? I did an interview, I think, four weeks ago with a robotics manufacturer from Japan, and they are now putting GPUs next to their control unit, next to their robot control unit. How much sense does that make for you? Well, I don't know the specific robot, but it does make sense. There's GPUs were taken into the mainstream compute about a decade ago when people realized that in the GPU environment, you can do a certain type of linear algebra very quickly because it's the same linear algebra essentially that has been driving ray tracing, let's say, in the 90s and 3D modeling of also computer games in the 2000s, that those can be useful for specific compute jobs that appear in AI training, deep learning training in particular, but also large-scale regression. I mean, that's not going away. It's also a sort of machine learning that is still very relevant. And also on the inference side, where essentially you compute scalar products. Now, that's something easily doable on GPUs. And so mm -hmm. if your robot, for example, has a tight feedback loop, why not put such a, maybe not the biggest GPU, such a specific scalar product unit nearby? We call it GPU, but it's used for a very clear mathematical purpose. And data movement is the cost, right? So I don't know if this audience maybe is not so much on the computer science quote side, but I like to quote Ken Betcher, one of the computer science heroes of the 70s, who always said, once you turn a compute job into an I.O. job, that's when you're doing supercomputing. Right? Okay. So once you realize that the data movement becomes your bottleneck, you need a speci specific architecture. And you could easily imagine a shop floor with millions of sensors. You don't want to pipe that data in a sorted, annotated, metadata-rich way into the cloud. You're going to pay interconnect fees. Then you do the compute there, and then you get your instructions back with a latency. By that time, your welding bead has just stopped, right? So that's why bringing compute close does have its use, even on the shop floor in a real-time environment. That's a good point, because we talk a lot about, about Gen AI, large language models, foundation models, and every week there's a new model with new bigger model. But from my point of view, or from an industrial point of view, we are solving problems that are not a real, let's call it blue-collar AI problems. And maybe we do not need this huge compute power on the shop floor. What is your opinion? I mean, shop floor is always so suggestive, right? You think of whatever, manufacturing plans for, let's say, cars or, Packaging or, or, or rockets yeah. or Yeah, or a logistics center that uh, shows packet packages left or right. The compute needed to train a large language model to talk about this year's biggest AI driver clearly is on the training side. And we see these very big models that you refer to, but we also see a trend towards smaller mod models. That's a, a maybe a different question to discuss a bit later. This training happens once mm -hmm. exactly. right, per model. Exactly. It happens where you have the corpus of data which is huge. I mean, some arguments in public papers these days, weekend magazines talk about the internet being exhausted yeah. as a training source. Yeah. So you do that once, then you have this we, big we, we need model. to talk about multi-model models, right? So that's the future, I think. Yeah. We, we do. But we also have to think about what do you do after this huge training run? How do you turn one such generic world knowledge, I mean, philosophically, maybe that's a difficult thing to say, but this corpus of knowledge incorporated in one huge model, 
how do you turn that into specialized models for a particular application? Exactly. A great example that we see in, in our industry, on our shop floor, which admittedly doesn't have uh, the noise and, and yes. the smell of oil that, that yeah. uh, we evoked earlier, is to take all manuals, Cray, the supercomputing company, and HPE, and SGI, and maybe even all digital and compact, and all the heritage that HPE as a company has been accumulating by, by mergers and acquisitions over the last three decades, how do we turn that corpus of manuals from how to change a specific module in a field replaceable unit to how do you operate that compiler version versus that compiler version into instructions available through a language model? How can we help users who may not have been around when a COBOL compiler was delivered 30 years ago to help them find stuff in a manual they've never looked at that maybe is out of print or a worn copy? How do we turn that into help desk style language models? That's a specialization. Many companies face the same problem with their internal documentation, right? You have all the different sources of internal memos, docs, requirement documents, and delivery documents. Um, that's a specialization. It's good that the model has been trained to speak your favorite language, sure. often English, yes. which is a problem. We, we do have, well, we have some, we have some many European. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a there's a huge effort ongoing for at the moment in one of our biggest customer installations, Lumi, up in Finland. Oh, we had an episode last week on with Silo. Yeah, right. So on the Finnish language corpus, there's more languages that are not on the mainstream of the internet, right? Where you need to speak. And there's a similar effort in Sweden ongoing with a public library which has the right to digitize any work in the Swedish National Library since 1690, roughly, mm -hmm. by a king's mandate from that time, uh, even ignoring the copyrights for the purposes of library purposes. And so they can digitize the Swedish language. So training this model, specializing it to your purpose, is a specific need. Now, in the end, you get a model that maybe needs to be run on-premise because it contains exactly. information that is protected by your IP department, by your legal department that you don't want to share and that is highly valuable and is much smaller in the end because you reduced it to the core that is of importance for a particular task. And the same holds for the shop floor, right? If you need guidance, maybe voice-based guidance or text-based guidance, how to deal with an escalation inside a packaging facility, a malfunctioning or a general change of input-output behavior, mm -hmm. whether it's a language model or a multimodal model that also gives you visual guidance, all of that is going to be on-premise for the need of short reaction times and specialized application. And then I won't need so much compute power. Right, because in the end, at that point, after this specific training, which maybe takes one or two orders of magnitude less compute to specialize, the usage, the inference part, if you want to call it that, is much lower compute. It's also much more embarrassingly parallel, as uh, if you want that, right? It could essentially run on a specific, maybe high-powered workstation, and you have multiple of those rather than one highly densely connected training computer, essentially a supercomputer, because for training, you have that high interconnectivity requirement of all the nodes computing together, while for the inference, it's much more detached. And you can clone that. How do you see the future of transformer architecture? Do we will see another architecture, a more energy-efficient, compute-efficient architecture in the future? It's hard to, to predict at the current pace of change of models and specific techniques inside these uh, deep learning models, whether transformer as we know it now is going to stay, is going to be replaced by a different transformer style or by yet another great invention. I'm not going to make predictions on that. Let's just watch the respective conferences every quarter. There's interesting new stuff the pudding is in the making, right? So what is coming out of these models is how we will evaluate the advance, whether it's scientific advance or practical advance in usability. The interesting part is that energy efficiency has risen to the mainstream awareness, not just in training and inference, in compute in general. And that's good, right? Because it's part of every company's sustainability question. Many companies have put forward their own sustainability goals aligned with this or that type of corporate group of companies in a specific sector or even national guided goals for sustainability. And it's very hard to get exact numbers 
on cloudy deployments. While your particular data center may give you numbers for the compute job that you ran, mm -hmm. this is misleading because at the time when you're not computing, the data center still has a footprint. There is all the transfer bandwidth that's hard to accommodate in your balance. And on site, you realize you pay for energy, you pay for cooling, you pay for the components. Some manufacturers have a hard time giving you the right information about the whole lifetime carbon analysis, for example, of the equipment. So that's a challenge for us in the industry. HPE is, is putting a lot of effort onto that. We have our own sustainability goals with a mm -hmm. neutral goal of 2040. But at the same time, we have customers who, who basically question our standard catalog saying, this is great. We have all the parts. We have the sizes, weights, shipping costs. Can you tell us the embodied carbon? Because and can you for example, is running carbon negative in balance okay. during operations which is a new thing for big data centers. Absolutely. So they're saying our whole question is how long do we have to run to offset the production and recycling carbon? That's a new question for us, right? Typically, people have focused on lifetime sustainability goals, not on the pre and post lifetime at the consumer. So recycling is something we have under control quite well. Component level resolution carbon footprint is something we are chasing. Many components we have For some, it's awfully difficult to get good numbers, and that's a challenge for the next five years, I would say, for the whole industry to come to a well-agreed, comparable standard of reporting. But is that only a European topic? Oh, no, 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 not at all. So okay. it's clearly European-driven to some degree, but it's, it's a worldwide topic. I mean, if you look at all the big Dow Jones reporting companies, they all have their sustainability goals as a company. So it's not a European-only thing. The customer side in Europe, is more aware of it. On the industrial side, as well as the academic side, which forms a large part, let's say the public AI spending. You, you shouldn't ignore that much of the advantages were driven both by, by the big corporates that we always cite, like Facebook and Google and, and Amazon, but also the publicly funded parts. Like Lumi, 50% of the jobs in this EuroHPC top facility, number five on the top 500 list of computers worldwide, is AI jobs mm -hmm. just now. That was not foreseen when the system was built, and it is what scientists, including some industrial users and some intermediate actors like Silo that you interviewed previously, are chasing. They're using that infrastructure for that purpose, and it's looking the same on other major installations, except the amount of industrial usage allowed for public procured system varies by system. You mentioned this public founders. How do we create more access to this public founded compute centers for small and mid-sized companies? Because I think that's a big, big problem. It is and it is not. There's clearly one major concern in this, which is regulations on public subsidies of industrial usage. And so every country and European level agreement needs to be adhered to, which sets a maximum usage policy for the particular procured system. But let's look at a positive example rather than complain about this, because in the end, it's about fair competition and you shouldn't really publicly fund what can be a part of a, of a TCO calculation and a budget for private enterprise. But if we look at, for example, HLRS in Germany, that's a great example that for years has enabled, especially the small and medium enterprises, but also some bigger ones in that region of Stuttgart that I'm don't have to name, mm -hmm. <laughs> to utilize resources of a publicly funded compute infrastructure, paying a consulting fee, paying a used fee, essentially predating the cloud. That model worked for like 15 years now. That's before enterprises moved to the cloud, saying, let's show you how to utilize this specific infrastructure for a purpose that you might not even have been aware of being an option for, for what your com your compute needs are. You don't have to do it at home. You don't have to buy that infrastructure until you realize it's better at home for data vicinity, data protection, and you've tried the particular algorithms. And so there's also a feedback into research because many students of that vicinity of Stuttgart have learned the use cases, have understood and maybe did a PhD on, on the topics and then found a job later, a highly qualified job with the particular domain, maybe not the same company, but similar companies. So there is a essentially a consulting entity that serves as a intermediary 
trying to understand the problem, bring it to the compute, showcase what can be done, and come to a commercially viable for both sides compute model. And I think that's a great example. Absolutely. And we're looking forward to a similar setup, maybe not in Stuttgart. We'll see how the procurement goes for the EuroHPC industrial HPC system that is on the table of the EuroHPC joint undertaking to be procured one or two systems in Europe in the next month or maybe a year, which is serving exactly that purpose. We hope for, I mean, not we, but the public hopes for an investment both from the European Commission, from the state or country where it's located, and some industrial stakeholders. But there's still a lack of infrastructure, right? So how do we solve this problem? Or is this problem also a new chance to go new ways? What is your opinion on that? I'm not sure which infrastructure you mean. I mean, there's always a lack of human infrastructure. But we also need compute power, more compute power in Europe. We need more, but we have quite a bit. So I wouldn't underestimate the amount of compute power we have, both through national and European investments. Of course, it's always easy to compute more, but it's an efficiency question. Exactly. So yeah. maybe for a small personal pledge here. So my team is involved with the bigger centers. We have in EMEA, you heard Lumi multiple times, but there are sure. also Arta to the national top tier system in the UK, the Eisenbart AI system, Kaust in uh, Saudi Arabia, where we work with the customer base, be it academic or industrial, to enable them to utilize these systems. And one of the big concerns we have day after day is how to compute more efficiently on the given infrastructure. And that's where, especially using GPUs, for many customer bases is still novel. Yes. And just taking your existing code and saying, now I run on GPU, gives you maybe a small speed up. Sometimes it gives you a slowdown. So that's not efficient. And it doesn't help to throw more hardware at the problem. We need to improve efficiency of the codes. Yeah, I can. mentioned, yeah, it's a chance, yeah. And, and after that, ways. there is enough resources. If you speed up your code by a factor of 100, some resources that you used previously will be free and your GPUs will not be busy for days. And so I would say on the large-scale infrastructures, we're seeing a good investment and it's a steady investment in recent years that is sufficient. We do need, of course, smaller locations close to the particular users and on-premise. But that's, I mean, for a company like HPE, that's attractive because we can provide these on-premise, cloud-like, but local installations with service or self-managed, enabling you to try out off-premise. And when you want to take it back, you buy, like one of our customers in Germany, Aleph Alpha, you buy a small data center on German soil, mostly self-operated. And I don't want to make it sound too small, but it's just a few dozen of GPUs. Just a few dozen. I mean, each of them is kind of costly, but that's much smaller than the 1,000 node deployment or 2,000 node deployment we do for the very big installations. Right? Yeah, absolutely. What hardware topics will we see in the next few years from your point of view? So there's going to be a strong push towards even denser integration of CPUs and accelerators. Okay. Most vendors will combine these in one way or another, either in discrete units, but matched to purpose on a subboard, maybe with chiplets, so that you can ask for your particular mix of more GPU, less GPU specific memories. Mm -hmm. a high bandwidth memory is a mainstream topic. Manufacturing problems of, of the initial years seem to have been overcome in most processes. So that's an interesting option to have more of this very high bandwidth close to chip memory, not just on GPUs, but close by. Unified memory across different device types is a topic. Now, with a grain of caution, I mean, I've, I'm old enough to uh, have seen that promise of <laughs> you don't have to care about locality. The yes. hardware is going to solve it. There is a lot of work left for compiler writers, for programming environment developers, middlewares. So all of that is not going away, but there's a promise that it's becoming easier across vendors, again, not singling out any particular one. There's still a steady stream, although it's reducing slightly, of novel accelerators, specific accelerators. So I'm not going to do advertisement for specific ones, but uh, there's domain-specific 
invent your favorite type of instruction or algorithmic pattern. Let's make an accelerator for that, Styles. Now, how many of those be commercially viable? That's an interesting thing to watch. Yes. You could say if it's a PCI card or CXL card, we can plug it into our systems and see what happens. CXL clearly is coming. Also, open compute modules, which allows you to mix and match better. But that's just standardization, right? It's at the low level and we... At the industrial purchasing level, we should be ignoring that and just say vendors will deal with that. But there is a bigger choice of pieces. It's not you buy this box, that's the solution. There's an interesting trend towards more standardized high-performance interconnects. We should never forget the interconnects. And you see that with, say, NVIDIA arguing for a number of years that they can build what is essentially a shared memory system around their GPUs. But we all know that shared memory systems going back to whatever, 20 years of SMP, the HPE, the machine, if you remember that a few years back, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that has scaling size limits, right? You can go so far and then at some point, this illusion of fully shared memory coherent is just not the path forward. So we will continue to need very large scalable systems with high performance interconnects. And that's the domain of classic supercomputing. I mean, even if you, if you don't do your crash simulations or other CFD codes or plasma codes, the same kind of compute patterns that let you ignore the scale of your system, making every node accessible in two to three hops with the same latency maximum and a constant bandwidth, depending on how much you invested in the interconnect across the whole system, ignoring topology, essentially, in many cases, that is a topic because large language model training needs that just as much as all of our other distributed compute. And so the interesting part that I want to make before, sorry for going yeah, two minutes no over that, is, no, no. is really um, we see Ethernet coming in that domain, which people Absolutely. would not have expected five years ago. The Ultra Ethernet Consortium is forming, bringing some of the plug-and-play interoperability of Ethernet with an upgrade the connection if matching pieces show up on the link option including security domains that extend beyond VLANs, but rather work on remote direct memory access patterns so you can run multi-tenant secure environments, but also have this high bandwidth single-sided operation that we know from supercomputing. And I think that's an exciting move forward because you can Absolutely. plug your, your standard switch and your printer sure. into the same fabric as your supercomputer. Because you mentioned some companies and we talked about the revival. How long will the revival last? Well, I don't know if it's a revival as such. It's just more different hardware. And, and we'll see after this, some people called it the Cambrian explosion two or three years back, right, yeah. of, of accelerators. We'll all see the reduction to a few core providers. But it's hard to say. I would give it two or three more years until we'll have the first specific accelerator surviving or all of them going away because GPUs are just... I don't, I don't think... That's going to be the case, if only because GPUs have become too powerful, too energy hungry, uh, and too big for to be the only solution for a high power compute. Right? We'll we'll see patterns emerging where you say, I could do with a quarter of that GPU, and it doesn't make sense to divide it into four tenants and still have one. I want a smaller entity and just deploy that. Uwe, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. All the best. Thanks. Thank you.